All right, hey you guys, John Britt here. Hey, I'm going to um, do a video today on the basic overview of ceramic geology for potters. Okay, super basic. I just wanted to give you an idea of where glazes, glazed materials come from. As you can see, I'm talking loud because I got my phone over there and I'm gonna go pick it up and then come and show you stuff. Um, so we, what we really want to get into people's mind when you're learning about glazes is that all these materials come from the earth. So we have to get them there first, then we process them, and then we process them into all the things we use. So today what I'll do, I'm gonna go through a little bit of the chemistry of some of the materials like granite and feldspar and stuff. Then I'll talk about rocks here. And then I'm going to uh, say what we then turn those into. And I'll show you some samples of some uh, like silica, feldspar, chert, stuff like that. And then what I mainly want to do is show you also that you can get this book, Ceramic Technology for Potters and Sculptors. I'll zoom in on it here in a minute. It's a really good book. It'll be an overview for you and make you go a little further into it. This is, I'm just gonna briefly touch on this. There's, it's a hugely vast subject, so you can go as deep as you want. Another thing to remember is that if you are interested in this stuff, um, you can go on to Facebook groups like Natural Materials, Natural Glazes. I've forgotten the names of these groups, but you'll find them on there. And there's a bunch of great people on there who can help guide you through all this process from finding clay to finding, you know, limestone or a granite or rhyolite or something. And then finally, what I'm going to do is show you an article I wrote. It was called Over the Counter Glazes. I'll zoom in here in a minute. And it was using only materials from Walmart to make glazes because all these materials that we talk about are made into our products which then you can read the ingredients and figure out which ones would be good for glazes. And I have recipes and stuff. All right, so let's get started. I'm gonna come and get my camera. And then we're going to go through this. So what the first thing to think about is, because uh, this is part of the free online glaze course on this channel. And we have gone through the unity molecular formula for looking at what's in materials. Uh, and so this is sort of an offshoot of that. So like right here is gonna be granite. This is, this is a representation of granite in unity molecular formula. So as you can see, this is our flux column. Potassium, sodium, magnesium, calcium. Those all add up to one. Uh, then this is going to be our, our refractory column or our stabilizer, alumina. And iron fits in that category. And then our glass former. So it's quite a bit of uh, silica in there. Tw 6 to 12 moles. Okay, so what happens in nature when you have granite, which I'm going to show you a little sample of here. This is granite. Uh, you, you've seen it in countertops and stuff. So that's what it is, and it has all these things in it, like there's probably mica in there and silica in there, and uh, this pink stuff is probably potassium feldspar. Okay, so what happens then to that is that is then going to break down over the course of millions of years. So it's going to have potassium, uh, alumina, and silica. This right here is potassium feldspar. And then this is uh, carbon dioxide and water will go off. So that's how granite will, over millions of years, turn into um, a feldspar uh, through weathering, at acidic and basic uh, uh, water and uh, freezing and thawing and all this happens and it will break down to feldspar. Then it can keep going. And this now is the clay molecule, Al2O3, 2SiO2. So that's kaolin. Because from the feldspar, we wash away the potassium, 
to potassium carbonate and then we wash away some silica and water and that process is called kaolinization. Okay, the process of forming kaolin. All right, so that's just a basic overview of what might happen. Now, in the lectures uh, next time, I'm going to talk more about clay bodies and stuff, clays, where we get them. And so that's sort of a lead into that. All right, so as far as geology goes, and, and basically in geology, people will be uh, saddened by this, but it's, a, it's, it's just a basic overview. Uh, it, so there's three types of rocks, igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks, okay? So for igneous rocks, we have two types. We have extrusive, which means it's volcanic, it comes out of the ground, and we have intrusive, which means it's below the surface. And so, as far as extrusive goes, volcanic, you're going to have an eruption. You're going to have basalt, or uh, uh, if, it, if it cools very quickly, it's going to be obsidian, which is glass. is is a like a um, it's like a, it's a basalt in glass form. And then you're going to have tuft, which is when it explodes up, it'll make splinters of uh, material up into the air in an explosive way. And uh, these are all materials that we may use in ceramics. Now, let me show you one main example. This would be an example of uh, basalt. And as this sits in the ground, it cools not real slow, but slow enough to form crystals. Those are olivine crystals. So that's an example of basalt. Now, some people may take this basalt and grind it up and make glazes out of it. Uh, and then other people just, you can purchase it. You can purchase pumice stone, uh, which is a, a volcanic uh, material. Tuft it becomes bentonite, which we all use a lot of uh, to suspend our glazes. All right, and I know there's more. I know people make uh, make glazes. Of, they make um, oil spot glazes with rhyolite and uh, uh, basalt and, you know, various. Uh, there's about a million forms in between all these things. I'm just giving you the overview. Okay, so then if, there, if it's an igneous rock that is stays in the ground below the surface that can form granites and feldspars okay and so what we're going to use is going to be like minspar custer cornwall rotten stone spodumene etc and there's a whole bunch more but i just want you to get a basic idea and then another type of uh, rock that's very um that we use a lot of stuff from is sedimentary. So this will be uh, sediment that's deposited uh, and in, say, for instance, limestone beds. So maybe seashells have all formed in an area and then they get covered over, then that'll make a, a limestone. Diatoms are little creatures that are, have silica shells and they may form a, uh, you know, a rock layer. Uh, dolomite sandstone shale etc and then all these evaporites which would be like uh, boron gersley borate these things will uh well i think lithium carb to a bunch there's a bunch of them and they're, they're uh, salts that will uh, be in dissolved in water and when that water um evaporates it'll form a layer of these materials so I've written them down. We, we're calling calcium carbonate or limestone whiting. Uh, dolomite has magnesium in it. Um, then you get all kinds of clays in sedimentary ways. Silica. I'll show you some chert. Uh, these are uh, different forms of silica aside from the silica that we're going to get in feldspar and granite. And then many things are formed in these salt flats, which colmanite, um, borax, gersley borate, etc. All right, so the last rock we'll talk about is metamorphic, and that is, uh, it changes. So you may have pressure and heat exerted on, say, an igneous rock. 
So the, uh, that may be granite. And then once it's sit under pressure and um, heat, it'll form nice or schist. Uh, and then some of those common ones that we know about are wollastonite and talc or soapstone. All right. So now let me just show you this a minute. This is the book I was talking about. It's a very good book by Yvonne Cuff here. Fantastic book. Has all kinds of stuff in it that I think you would like. Very easy to read and a lot of um, practical things in the back here. They have all kinds of like... Uh, projects for you to do and ways to understand glazes okay so while we're on before i get to this little chart which is very easy to understand let's just look here is some uh, i showed you this basalt with the olivine and then here is obsidian so this is a uh, quickly cooled basalt and it forms a glass and you know in the olden days uh they would carve um, arrowheads out of these, chip them, and they'd make really cool arrowheads. Um, and then some other things we were talking about. This is a feldspar. We live near a feldspar mine here in North Dakota, and this is a soda spar. I'm pretty sure it's from here. Um, you can see inside here there's all kinds of um, mica, and uh, you can see impurities all in there. But, but when you find the like pure structure of a feldspar, it'll oftentimes have this planar surface like this. Here's a really good example of it. See how this shape is, and it just break, it cleaves in those uh, in that shape. So that's oftentimes how you can find it is by the structure that is laying in the ground. All right. And they have dental feldspar. That means it's just more potassium. This is uh, spodumene. Uh, I just have small samples, nothing magnificent. But here's a mica. And you can see the way mica will just break. It just breaks off into little sheets. Let's see if I can just peel some off there for you. Yeah, so it breaks off into these sheets. And they used to use these in uh, like window panes or uh, they used circuit boards and all kinds of stuff. So it's really fun to look up what the uses of all these materials are. All right, so here's like a silica. This is a silicon crystal. This is a um, uh, silica rock. from That's from Arkansas. Uh, and this is chert and other forms of um, silica with impurities in them. Oh, this one's cool. This is a uh, silicon, C O N. This is this is a um, uh, this is when the uh, oxygen is taking off taken off of silica and it's a very interesting material. We don't really use it in ceramic, but I still thought it was interesting. Uh, I'm going to just show you a couple of these without going into each one because we don't, really don't have time for all that. This is um, talc. So this is like, uh, this is also known as soapstone. And the reason they call it that is very uh, s s slippery. Um, this is one of my favorites. These are called, this is, I uh, uh, forgot the name now, what it was, uh, tourmaline. This is tourmaline. And this is uh, precipitates out of a uh, igneous intrusive uh, batholith to to help uh, get rid of all the uh, well what it does is all the metallic things are in here and then you can produce a kaolin a white kaolin in that way so I'll talk about that next time I like to show this one because this is galena this is from Leadville uh, Colorado this is what they used to glaze uh, pots with they grind this up and uh, just put it on their pot, so that would be lead glazed pottery. And then I like this one because it is uh, it looks like somebody made it, but it's actually natural formation. Very sharp edges. Beautiful crystal of pyrite. All right, and here's uh, like a gypsum crystal. Here's a kyanite crystal. Uh, Ambligenite. And then, like, here's a, bar a crystal form of barium. 
Here are, um, I'm sorry, that's the wrong label there. This is a manganese nodules from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this, is, this is how uh, copper will form. Here's another one. And here's copper with um, pyrite crystals. And this is Gersley borate. This is how it can form a crystal form like this. But you're not usually going to find them like that. Um, these are just samples for you. All right, so now what I want to say is, say we, say we find some material in the ground. One, one good way to do that is to get some of these books. They're Roadside Geology of a State. I like this one because I lived in Ohio. And you could just look for uh, what highway you were on, and it'll tell you what the formations are there. It's a really good way to understand geology in your area. But they have them for many states, and there's probably many other ways to learn about geology in your area. But just uh, as a practical point, I went down to Johnson City in Tennessee, and I went to a road cut. <laughs> you can see all the leaves and stuff. And I found this. This is shale. So it's little chips. And so, uh, it, so what it is is a clay that has been smashed in the earth. And so it's not been heated up to, enough to make slate, but it's going to make shale. And then I can take that. I brought it home. I got out all the leaves and everything. And then I ground it up and I put it in a ball mill. And then I can turn it into this powder. This, this appears to be chunky, but it's really a powder. I did it wet ball milling, so it, uh, when it dried on the plaster bat, it gets kind of chunky. But I can use this now as my clay ingredient, a local clay for my glazes. All right? Let me just show you this chart. This chart is from this book. I just blew it up a little. So, so say, for instance, you looked here. You can have sedimentary rock, like clay. It can, uh, it can be deposited and smashed a little. It'll become shale. And then if it's underground and metamorphic and heat, it'll form slate or hornfells. And these are the other ways things go, like from sand to sandstone to quartzite, calcium, so limestone will form marble when it's metamorphic, etc. All right? So that, that's a basic idea of what you can, how you can process things. Now, say for instance, you wanted to process some of this feldspar. This is going to be harder, but what you might do is smack it with a hammer a bit, and then I throw them into a bisque load, and that will break the bonds. It'll start to become a powder, and you can whack it a little with the hammer. And then if you, because if you don't have a ball mill, it's hard to, to process all this stuff. If you have a hammer mill or something, but you know, I didn't really need to buy all this equipment. I just wanted to try and see how it, how I could do it on my own. And then I, if it's a big chunk, I'll stick it back in and bisque fire it again and then smash it up and um, run it through a sieve. And then you have local feldspar for your glazes. Okay. Well, I think that covers what I've got there. Now what I'm going to show you is what I did here was I have an article. You can Google it. Over-the-counter glazes, John Britt Pottery. It was in Ceramics Monthly some time ago, quite a while, probably 20 years ago. And what I did was I took materials that I could buy from like Walmart or the, you know, the store or something, and then I made glazes. Okay, so just uh, so and this was cone 10. And so I have recipes here, like here's a blue celadon recipe 50 grams of pumas, two Alka Seltzer, 12 Rolades, and some Crest toothpaste. That made a really nice blue celadon. Or I have this, uh, this one here is satin green. So pumas, Alka Seltzer, and talc. And that made this really nice um, green celadon glaze. Okay, so what, just so you know, what we're getting, we're, this essentially is our feldspar, the pumas. Um, and this is a, a rotten stone. Uh, it's, got, it's a little more iron than this does, but you can buy these. And so then I um, 
that was a sanding medium for woodworkers. And then this Rolaise is essentially um, uh, calcium carbonate with sugar and flavoring. So that was my calcium source, and this was my sodium source, was Alka-Seltzer. You can read on the pack what they are. But I just made all these nice glazes with this, and I thought it was a fun project. It's a great project for kids to learn about uh, geology and pottery and um, uh, you know chemistry and stuff. All right? I think that's all I got. So what I'll do is do the next lecture will be on Kalins. Here's an here's an example. I got this from a guy in Arkansas, and this was a like a pink kaolin that was deposited there. So we'll talk about more about kaolins and ball clays and fire clays and stuff next time. All right. We'll talk to you later. You need to read some of these books and make some glazes out of local materials.